It's past seven on LBC. Welcome to the programme. I'm Ian Dale with you here until 10 o'clock tonight. Now, we're going to talk to somebody who I think has had a huge influence on uh, the government over the last couple of years. And he was our Brexit negotiator uh, under Boris Johnson. And it's Lord Frost, David Frost. Welcome to the programme, David. Now, we're going to talk a little bit between ourselves to begin with. And then we're going to come to calls. If you have a question for David, not just on the Brexit negotiations, but also where he sees the concern party going in the future, what it's like working for Boris Johnson. Um, we'll get some of his reaction to the events of this week as well. So lots to talk to him about between now and 8. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. Well, we've got to start off with the Brexit negotiations because um, you, you were... I mean, there, there were various different Brexit negotiation, negotiators and you sort of inherited an existing position. When you first were first offered the job by Boris Johnson, did you think, yeah, this is something I'd really love to do? Or did you think, oh, my God, this is a poison chalice? So I thought at first, um, yeah, great. You know, this is what I've spent my life kind of preparing for. I'd done a lot of EU work in the Foreign Office, a lot of negotiating. I'd worked with Boris in the Foreign Office in the early phases, so I thought, great, yes, can do this. And then after about a week, I, I started getting sleepless nights and realising just what we'd taken on with this uh, apparent terrible impasse, a withdrawal agreement, the Parliament wouldn't agree, all the Just others remind us when rejected. this was. This was... Was this, this was the middle of, middle of 2019. Right. Um, uh, and, you know, we had this withdrawal agreement that Parliament had rejected. Every other alternative had been rejected. We seemed to be stuck in this famous backstop. There seemed to be no way forward. And, yeah, it was quite daunting, but it, somebody had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you should maybe go back a little bit because you, you had a quite a high-profile high career in the Foreign Office. You then left for a bit and you were you ran the Scotch Whiskey Association and then the the, is it the London Chamber of... Yeah, briefly. British, briefly. British Chambers of Commerce, one London or the other. Chamber Commerce, and, yeah. um, so you, you had quite a grounding in diplomacy and presumably that experience helped you at the beginning. Yeah, it did. And there's a kind of technique to international negotiations. You know, people know the ropes. They're not like negotiations in the private sector, for example, between companies. There's a kind of game to be played. There are courtesies to be observed. Um, and the style is different. And I think training for that, having spent a lot of my time negotiating as part of the European Union, helping the EU negotiate with others, that was all prep for, mm. for what came. And... Tell me about your first meeting with Michel Barnier, because I, I always thought he got a really easy ride from the British media, and um, I mean, did right up until the end in, in many ways. What were your impressions of him before you met him, and were those impressions confirmed when you met him? Yeah, I think Michel is a, is a serious guy. He represented the EU very well. He had incredible political and diplomatic experience and the EU had a very clear set of positions on things and this uh, the UK this country you know did not for the first two or three years of this process and I think he couldn't avoid uh, sort of being slightly disdainful I suppose of you know what seems like lack of preparation lack of certainty about where we wanted to go so that was one of the things when we came in when Boris Johnson and I came in we wanted to change that be serious be clear about what we wanted and I, I think he appreciated that um, it took time to adjust but you know he's a he's a serious guy and we we got on well despite our different backgrounds and approaches did things change over the months though because it for my memory is that at the beginning you very much didn't want to do the sort of media side like David Davis and Dominic Raab had done where they would appear with him at a press conference and in a sense, some of the negotiations seem to be conducted in public. And you didn't seem to have that approach at the beginning. But as things progressed, it, it, it almost became inevitable that you'd have to. Yeah, it did, I think. And the first, you know, the first six months in the run up to the election um, and the withdrawal from the EU, that was a very special period in many ways. Uh, you know, we were 
we'd inherited something we did we we to a large extent didn't agree with we were simply in persuasion mode we simply had to get the job done and that required very much behind the scenes process by the time we were doing the trade negotiations in 2020 we'd, we'd won the election it's become much clearer much the much more political yeah i had to sort of step out from the the shadows slightly because people expected to know what was going on at the, at the same time you know i wasn't a, i mean i'm still not an elected politician i wasn't a politician at all and you know i had to respect the fact that um um you know ultimately i was working to the prime minister and and you know real politicians so there were limits you said you said something very interesting just then you said we had to get it done and that was effectively Boris Johnson's slogan would get Brexit done, certainly at the 2019 election. Do you in retrospect think that corners were cut in the negotiations just to get it done? And you, I mean, you know where I'm leading to on that. Uh, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, well, no. Uh, I think um, we had got to a position where um, the, you know, the constitutional norms of the country were breaking down because Parliament didn't want to deliver on the clear referendum result. There was no majority for doing it, at least in the form that the Theresa May government brought it forward. And, you know, Parliament had kind of taken over the negotiations in a, in a sort of Cromwell-style way, mm. running them from Parliament without proper opposition. Um, and we had to change that. And we thought it was right to prioritise delivering the result. It was inevitably going to be a bit imperfect by that point because we were coming in right at the end of it. But we had to restore constitutional normality, deliver on the democratic vote. And that's what we prioritised. And I think it was the right thing to do. Well, moving on to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is the one bit of Brexit that um, really hasn't been done because it's it's still sort of plaguing relations in a way between this country and the European Union. Could that have been handled differently? <clears throat> it, it could in the sense I would rather not have started from where we had to, to start. I think there were very few options by the time we came in. We simply had to get the country out of this wretched backstop that um, the, the the policy on Northern Ireland had locked us in, and that's what we, we tried and eventually succeeded in doing. Um, ideally, we should have pushed much harder, much earlier, for a kind of normal... Um, uh, relationship between Northern Ireland and and Ireland, you know, a, a, a customs border that was open but existed, was policed in in new ways, uh, and where Northern Ireland was properly part of our normal sort of lawmaking zone. But by the time we came in, most of that had been conceded, and it was difficult. So you're blaming to Theresa May for that, basically. Well, I. Um, I, I, I do to some extent. I think her problem obviously was that she uh, didn't have a majority herself after the 2017 election and was manoeuvring with a parliament that didn't want to do the job. So I absolutely sympathise with, with how she got there. But, uh, it, you know, nevertheless, what the Theresa May government delivered was an agreement that wouldn't get through Parliament. And we had to deal with that. How, how do you think the atmosphere in the negotiations changed once Boris Johnson became Prime Minister? Because he was a totally different kettle of fish for them. I mean, he had been Foreign Secretary before, so they, they had had some dealings with him. But um, how can I put this? He that There were quite a few European leaders who didn't like dealing with him. And I remember David Davis said to me once that um, he spent half his time going around Europe clearing up after Boris. <laughs> um, well, I, I think um, I, I don't know about that. I think Boris has a you know a unique style, and um, I which think, some leaders related to and others didn't. I think yeah, that's a fair way. I think that's yeah. that's perhaps fair, though. I think I would also say more did than than didn't. And one of his strengths is uh, sort of striking up rapport and relationship with, with people in a way that others don't. Um, no, I mean, I think the problem we had was that, um, uh, you know, many Europeans simply did not believe that that first Boris Johnson government would last. You know, it would come in in very difficult circumstances. There seemed to be chaos around us. You know, there were times when I didn't know, when it came into work in the morning, didn't know whether we'd still be in power in the evening. Mm. In, you know, in those circumstances, I think a lot of them were tempted to see, well, let's play this out. Let's see if they really can deliver, play really hard, not sort of empathise and try and help. And that was why it was so tough. And did that 
change on December the 3rd, was it December the 12th, the election? I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. The, the day after the election, I just thought this whole atmosphere has changed yeah. now. 100% changed totally. Um, we'd won the election. It was crystal clear in the mandate what we were going to do. Leave the customs union, leave the single market, restore self-government in the UK. And the atmosphere changed internally as well because, um, you know, some of the civil service, some of the pure permanent bureaucracy also, you know, I, I think had slightly questioned, you know, what the legitimacy of the Boris Johnson government was. And that disappeared after the election. Nobody could question it. We'll have more time with David Frost in just a moment and we'll come to your calls as well. 0345 6060 973. It's quarter past seven on LBC. This is LBC. Ian Dale on LBC. 18 minutes past seven on LBC. Um, th there have been calls, not least from what, well, one senior Conservative uh, MP, Tobias Elwood, for us to go back into the single market. Now, most Conservative MPs poo-pooed that and it, it suspected it ruined any leadership ambitions he ever had. But when you look at some of the bureaucracy that there is now that, that's affecting our ability to import and export, I mean, even you must think, did we do the right thing? No, I, I, I don't have any doubts about that. Uh, we definitely did do the right thing. We restored self-government and proper democracy to this country, and um, a lot of things go with that. People forget what being in the single market is. It isn't just what happens at the border. It's that you're giving another power the ability to regulate all your domestic regulations, all your trade, all your services, free movement of people, you lose control of the borders, and you get no say. In those things, I mean, I can't. I just can't see how that would be a, a sensible thing for a free country to do. But it was our creation in the first place, wasn't it? It was Margaret, Margaret Thatcher's creation in 1992. 
It was, and I think um, obviously what happened is that the the purity of the original single market concept that was really about uh, you know, trade, pure and simple, uh, got expanded. It got expanded to all sorts of extra kinds of regulation, environment regula- regulation, employment legislation, the rules on free movement became much more purist. And of course, the whole EU expanded into something rather different to what we we first thought. So, I mean, nobody says there are not good elements to being in the EU. The question is, what's the overall trade-off? And I think the overall trade-off had stopped working for us. But when you look at the labour shortages that many sectors in this country are experiencing at the moment, a lot of people are putting that, at least in part, down to the fact that we don't have access to labour from the EU in the same way that we did before. Now, there has to be an, at least an element of truth to that. Well, we um, we gave out a million visas last year uh, to people to come and vote, uh, work here. So um, it's not obvious to me that the, the labour shortage you know, exists in those terms. I don't think the problem is lack of people coming into the country. I think it's that for whatever reason, um, you know, some people in this country have stopped working, whether it's early retirement or whether they, they, they have long COVID or whether they just don't want to come back in quite the same way. And do, that's very clear. Do you think, think therefore, that the immigration rules, whether it's relating to people from Europe or elsewhere, need to be relaxed? Because there are clear, real difficulties for a lot of sectors in our economy at the moment. There are, and they're not only in the UK. Uh, There are labour shortages everywhere. There are similar problems across Europe. There are similar problems in America. These aren't all due to to Brexit. I mean, I would... I don't think, you know, immediately after leaving the customs union, the single market and all of that, I think, you know, it is reasonable to have a transition... Uh, to 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 sort of uh, gradually change the uh, the numbers we we allowed in this country to work, but I, I definitely think it needs to go down over time. What? Why does it need to go down? I've never really understood this argument because I remember during the whole period after 2016, and I think I said before the referendum, I said if people expect immigration to go down. They, they are operating under an illusion because the, the level of immigration, at least I, I think in most part, is dependent on the needs of the economy and that's how it should work, surely. So I think the problem is that our economy had begun to adjust to an essentially unlimited supply of labour from the European Union, certainly at a sort of relatively low, medium skill levels. It was essentially unlimited. You didn't have to bother training anybody. You didn't have to bother investing in anybody. You could just, just recruit. And that meant that some some Brits got squeezed out of the labour market. And I don't think that's a sustainable model. In the end, companies here have to invest and support UK labour force if this country is going to work as a nation state and I I think that's really important. One more question from me before we go to the calls Um, and by the way we are streaming this live on Global Player and the LBC YouTube channel if you'd like to watch. Um, Going back to the Northern Ireland Protocol, Boris Johnson once said there will never be a border down the Irish Sea while I'm Prime Minister uh, and then told Northern Irish business people they wouldn't have to fill in extra forms. That is... That's just not, that wasn't true, was it? Well, I think um, people, as, as so often with Boris, kind of exploit what he says and um, exaggerate well, it's pretty, it. Well, hang on, you can't, well, how can you exaggerate that? It was pretty clear. His particular, his the specific comment about um, if you're given a form, take it and throw it in the bin, was about trade moving from Northern Ireland to GB. And indeed, there are no barriers uh, between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Well, tell so, that to Sainsbury's and Marks so and Spencer. There, there are customs checks and they are far too rigorous for movements from GB to Northern Ireland but there are no uh, processes the other way and never have been and that's what he was talking about in that interview. So what is the future because there's clearly an impasse now between us and the European Commission on this. When Liz Truss took over um, after you resigned it seemed that she had built up a rather good relationship uh, with the Commissioner Sefcovic um, but that with the gap with the war in Ukraine, that seems to have shattered now. How do you see things going forward? So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that shows uh, Liz had a really um, good try at establishing a different kind of relationship with with Marosh. Um, But in the end, national interests matter. 
and you know whether two negotiators like each other or not. In in the end, it sort of helps at the margin, but it isn't fundamental. And uh, the EU has so far taken a fundamental decision. They don't want to change the protocol, and unfortunately, in the way they want to operate it, it is now unworkable. It has unleashed a set of political de um, developments that are putting the Good Friday Agreement at real risk, and it, it can't work. It has to change. The only question is how it changes. But wasn't all this eminently predictable? No, I don't think it was. I mean, we knew that we were taking a risk with the, the form of the protocol that we, in the end, had to agree. We never wanted the customs bit of it, but in the end, because but, we were not allowed to that's leave... that's almost admitting to taking a risk with the whole of the Northern Ireland peace process. Well, I if we had not done that, we would have been taking a risk with the Constitution of the UK because we wouldn't have been allowed to leave the European Union. The um, uh, Parliament, the Ben Burt Act, the Surrender Act said you can't leave without a deal. So we had to get a deal. But surely peace in Northern Ireland is more important than constitutional niceties? They're both extremely important. I think delivering on the biggest democratic vote that we ever had in this country is also important. But you clearly prioritised the constitution over the peace process. No, we didn't. The protocol is there to support the peace process, and that's what we both believed that it would do. Uh, in 2019. It, it's, it hasn't. It's, no, because the EU are uh, treating the uh, the boundary between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, which largely takes small shipments of goods and smallish lorries and small quantities, as if it was like Rotterdam for trade, you know, huge container ships. But, but you surely have to, to take your share of the blame for the fact that this isn't working. You You were the lead negotiator on this. I, I think the reason it's not working is because the EU are insisting on, on a very purist way of doing it. And actually, I think the thing that destroyed confidence in the protocol very quickly was their um, attempt to put a vaccines ban, a ban on export of vaccines from Ireland to Northern Ireland in January last year. For, for the last five years, we've been told that there could be no process of the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. It's completely impossible. Nothing could be done. You could never change anything. And then all of a sudden, because it suited them, they tried to do it. And that destroyed belief in the the workability of the protocol in large parts of Northern but Ireland. I know I said one more question. I think I've asked five so far, but this is the final one. Um, in terms of introducing legislation now to enable us to withdraw completely from the protocol, why is that even necessary? You could just invoke, or they could just invoke Article 16. You could do Article 16. I think there are limits on what you can do with Article 16. Uh, it is a safeguard provision within the, the protocol. And I think, it, although it would, I think, improve the situation, it, it, it probably wouldn't produce stability in the, the long run. And I think it is safer to do what it looks like the government's doing. I mean, we'll have to wait and see for the, for the bill to, to have something as unambiguous in UK law. Right, over to your questions now. It's your chance to ask Lord Frost whatever question you like, 0345 973 Let's go to Philip in Lee on the Solent. Hello, Philip. Hello, good evening. Evening, what would you like to ask? Uh, a very simple question. Lord Frost was famously uh, supportive of the single market when um, he was uh, involved with the Scottish Whiskey Association. What changed Lord Frost? Well, as you say, um, Philip, I was working for the Scotch Whiskey Association and their policy for uh, much of the time I was working for them was indeed that it suited the Scotch whisky industry to stay in the, the European Union. And I think um, many of us, I think, you know, had an open mind on this question until quite late. The... Um, it was only after the David Cameron negotiation failed shortly before the referendum that I think it became clear the situation couldn't recover and leaving was the the only way. So I think that that sort of background and that direction of travel is is part of this. Philip, thank you. Um, would would you agree, Lord Cross, that the uh, referendum was advisory? 
Oh, I feel as if we're refighting old battles here now, <laughs> but carry on. <laughs> I think we're, we're probably going to do a bit of that, I suspect, in um, the next half hour. Well, look, it, it, it may have been formally advisory, but the reality is that all politicians and all political parties committed before it to respect the results. And I think um, that it, if that commitment had been gone back on, the, the consequences for the political stability and trust would have been great. So in the end, I think it's a distinction without a difference, to be honest. Philip, thank you very much. Um, how have you adapted to this new role since you resigned? Because you are now a member of the House of Lords. Um, so you, I mean, you weren't a politician. You were you were, you were a diplomat and, and then came out of the Foreign Office, and as we say, worked for the Scottish Whisky Association and the London Chambers of Commerce. But how do you... Are you enjoying this new political role? Because it can be quite a rough game, can't it? Yeah, I enjoy some of it. And, um, you know, it is great to more or less have the freedom to say what I want about things and to think about things and try and argue a case about things. And my inability to do that as a civil servant was one of the reasons why I, in the end, left and did other things. I think what I do find is... Um, you know, I think most politicians, by the time they are ministers, have, uh, you know, had a career in politics. They've been members of parliament, they've done whatever. They've got used to the kind of rough and tumble and the extreme criticism you get now on, on social media. And this all hit me quite suddenly. And kind of dealing with that has, uh, you know, it's taken some getting used to. So Alistair Campbell has just tweeted, um, seeing that you're on the programme, he says, Frost is a symbol of the rottenness of our political and media ecosystems. Utterly useless hack negotiator who's failed spectacularly and is now treated by the Tory right like some kind of political sage. I mean, when, when you hear people say things like that, does that get to you or you, it's just water off a duck's back? So I, I have to not let it get to me. And, you know, Alistair Campbell, um, you know, he spends half his time campaigning on mental health and the other half insulting people on Twitter. And I don't quite see how those two things really go together. Um, I, I think, I, you know, I just have to put up with the fact that some people will not look at me objectively. They don't like Brexit. They can't see anything other than through that that prism. And, and so be it. And of course, many people see Alistair in the same way for things he did in his time in government as well and I think that's just how it is. I, I've just been listening to his podcast uh, today and I mean he's, he has accused the Prime Minister of taking cocaine uh, in an inter before an interview after the vote last Monday. Uh, it, how do you react, well A, how do you react to that and B, I mean, I've got to ask you, have you ever seen any sign of that happening? Well, I've certainly never seen any sign of that. No, absolutely not. Um, uh, and it would never have occurred to me, I must say. Um, I, I just find it very, very strange. I think, you know, Brexit has um, sent some people off the, the deep end. They can't look at it objectively. I call it Brexit sad. derangement syndrome yeah. on both sides, actually. I, absolutely. I, it, but th there is a version of it. Andrew Adonis admitted that he suffered from it, yeah. so <laughs> that was something. Um, David, we'll have more calls in just a moment. It's 7.32. Let's get the latest headlines on LBC from Amelia Cox. Two British men fighting for Ukraine have been sentenced to death by pro-Moscow rebels. 28-year-old Aidan Aslin and Sean Pinner, who's 48, were captured by Russian forces in April. Police in Devon have found the bodies of two people after a boat capsized on a lake. Two others were taken to hospital after it happened in Loudown near Oakhampton yesterday afternoon. And the PGA Tour has suspended all of its members who are playing in this week's Saudi-funded Live Golf Invitational. Six-time major winner Phil Mickelson is among the biggest names to be affected. LBC weather, light rain pushing into the east this evening, largely dry overnight with some showers in the far southeast and northwest, a low of nine degrees. LBC.
LBC. 7.35 on LBC. You can watch us on Global Player. David Frost, Lord Frost, is with me. So much to talk about with him. And we're going to take more of your calls now. Harry's in Portsmouth. Hi, Harry. Oh, yes, hello. Good evening, uh, Ian and Hi. Lord Frost. Um, bearing in mind that the EU, we knew a lot many decades ago that the EU always adopted an unbending, inflexible policy and would never give more than they had to. Do you think the fact that Russia has started a war in Ukraine connected with NATO, but of course also indirectly connected with the EU, the fact that the EU is always expanding, you know, just like many empires, the Roman Empire was stopped by the Scottish Highlands. They couldn't get, go any further. Do you think they've come up against something and the Russians have decided to use force? A bit like in Northern Ireland where we were up against the IRA, they won in the end by the, by the use of the armour light and sending the mortar into Downing Street. Well, there's a lot there. To, yeah, to so I, I, I think... Um, hi, Harry. I think... Um, you know, I, I, I Let's think... just pick out one, one point from what Harry said there. Essentially, I think he was saying, do you think that the expansionist nature of the yeah. EU has in part contributed to the war in Ukraine? No, not really. I don't think so. Um, I think there's a huge difference between... Um, uh, a, a sort of um, establishing a trade agreement, which which countries all around the world do for all sorts of different reasons, and wanting to an, abolish another state and wind it up into yours. And I don't think anything justifies what the Russians have have done and their their barbarism in in Ukraine, which is not to say we mustn't look rationally at the situation that there now is and navigate ourselves through it very carefully. But you know, I'm inclined to blame the EU for quite a lot, but I don't think we can reasonably blame them for the way Putin is behaving. Harry, thank you. Let's move on to Jazz in Camden. Hello, Jazz. Hi, good evening, Ian. Good evening, Lord Frost. I just wanted to ask, um, do you not feel any shame or guilt for walking away from your role as Brexit negotiator, especially seeing as the UK now wishes to renegotiate the deal that you put, that you essentially negotiated it in the first place and was marketed as oven ready by the PM. Uh, 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 thanks, Jazz. No, I don't. Um, I was really sorry to leave government in December, but um, some things, some principles are more important than anything. And I felt very strongly at the time that the country was descending into a third, fourth lockdown um, that was totally unnecessary and that's why I left. I spoke against the Plan B measures in Cabinet and when I was overruled I knew I, I had to leave and um, unfortunately some things when you were a minister are so big and are so important as a matter of principle that you, you just have to deal with them and take the consequences and I'm very glad that I think my departure was part of the reason why in the end the Prime Minister took the decisions he did and shied away from another lockdown and thank goodness he did. But in terms of the negotiations with the EU, I mean you've been doing it for several years, you had everything in your head and then Liz Truss has to come in and pick it all up. Um, did that not, was that not a factor in your decision? So, well how can I hand all of this over to someone completely new? Well, I, I haven't gone away, and we, we do talk uh, from time to time, uh, Liz and I, and obviously, you know, what I know is available to the team, much of which uh, uh, is still in place and doing it. So I don't think it can all depend on me in the end. Um, this country has decided to leave the EU. That's a stable state. We need uh, politicians, negotiators, leaders who... Um, accept that, can live with it and get get on with delivering the benefits. So w would she ring you up and say, look, we're thinking of doing this new bill, what do you think? So it's not as specific as that. We um, we we're in touch about you know what I what my experience from the the negotiations, what has worked, what what hasn't, and you know obviously elements of detail for why we pursued things, but I haven't had any insights into secrets. No. Jazz, would you like to come back? Uh, yes. Um, when you say that uh, you wanted to resign 
in reference to the COVID restrictions that the PM and the Cabinet wanted to bring in. Um, wouldn't you re- uh, agree that the uh, COVID restrictions and the Brexit negotiations were two completely different things? I understand the point of minis- uh, ministerial principles and stuff like that, but um, the COVID situation was in the present and the Brexit negotiations would be long and far-reaching and they would I think some, many would argue that seeing as you were the negotiator of the deal, uh, you should have stayed in place for the long run to see it through, even the renegotiations. Well, I, I mean, I do understand the argument, obviously, the, the, but, but I think we are sort of forgetting what it was like on COVID. We're all now able to say, well, COVID, you know, as it was last, last Christmas, you know, turned out not to be much of a thing after all. And we didn't need to lock down. It wasn't as dangerous as we thought. But, but at the time, it looked like, you know, we're in for another few months of, of gloom. And um, I, I, don't, I think some things are just too big when you're a cabinet minister. You just have to accept that. You know, if, 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 if the country's going to a war, you can't say that's the business of just of the Ministry of Defence and kind of abrogate responsibility for it. So some things are just they're, they're about the running of the country. When, when you told Boris Johnson that you were going to resign, did he not appeal to your sense of patriotic duty to continue? He was disappointed uh, I was going. There's, <laughs> there's that no a euphemism doubt. for... There's no doubt about that. Very angry. And, and no, no, I don't. It, it wasn't actually. It was um, uh, very amicable, and you know, it's unfortunate that um, uh, my departure got got leaked uh, in a way that uh, made it look more dramatic than it was really intended. Do, do you still speak to him? We're in touch. Yeah, because I mean, you've said some quite tough things um, about the direction of the government and the direction of the Conservative Party, and you, you've become a bit of a. A uh, hero for some people on on the right who want the Conservative Party to go back to its sort of what they would see as its true principles, and you've become their standard bearer. Was was that your intention? Well, I, I seem to have. It wasn't really the intention. I think politics has turned out to be a bit more fraught uh, since Christmas than we thought it was going to be, probably for for various reasons. Um, but uh, you know, I have. Um, I've criticised policy, I think, and not alone in that. I think many people are uh, doubtful uh, about the direction of policy. I haven't criticised the Prime Minister, I haven't criticised his his leadership. And, um, well, you kind of have, I mean, at least obliquely. Well, the, the leader is responsible for the policy. And I think on certain areas of policy, we've we've taken a wrong track, yes. But I think it's also a very easily correctable track. And it'll be very easy to get back in line with where the party and voters want us to be. And I hope that's what's going to happen. There's been a lot of speculation that you might have stood in the Tiverton and Honiton by-election. Obviously, you haven't done that. But is it part of your long-term plan to maybe uh, stand for the House of Commons and resign your seat in the House of Lords? Well, I, I was a bit surprised by the speculation, to be honest. Um, I, I hadn't, I didn't leave, kind of expecting a kind of afterlife. Um, but, but people are speculating, and people have asked, and a lot of people have been quite supportive of the idea. So we'll, we'll see if the opportunity arises, and it might, and it might not. We'll, we'll see. But well, it wasn't I'm taking that as a plan. yes. It wasn't part of a plan. But you have to be on the Conservative approved candidates list to do that. Is that your intention to apply to go on that? So, uh, I, as I say, we're, we're not at that point yet. But you are thinking about it, clearly. I'm, I'm thinking about it, yeah. Okay. I'm sure. Um, let's go to Jeff in Carmarthen. Hello, Jeff. Good evening, Ian. Um, Hi. I, I'm, ho- I'm hoping that uh, Lord Frost and you can all agree what a fantastic weekend for the creative industries. Um, uh, doing music, sound, makeup, uh, drones, lighting, all the stuff that went into the Jubilee weekend. What a fantastic weekend. I'm a musician. I've got gigs waiting for me in London, I, uh, in Europe. I can't play them. It's not cost effective. There's the, the, the carnets are far too expensive. Um, you can only go out for several days. It's just impossible. Why didn't Lord Frost do a deal with the EU, which they wanted to do, for, for artist passports? So, Jeff, uh, the the answer to that is that they didn't want to do a deal on terms they did, that they did. Uh, they, did. They, they 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 well, I think I was in the negotiations, and the deal they they wanted to do with us you didn't like was a deal. deal 
that would have bound us permanently uh, to restrict our freedom of movement. And unfortunately, you know, like it or not, uh, the uh, a major issue in the referendum and everything that followed was changes to the freedom of movement regime. Now, yeah, it, I would have liked money, us. Lord, Russ, you're taking money out of my pocket and millions of creative people in this country who want to just be able to go out into Europe, do a job and come back. And you've taken that away from us. And it's, that's why the, the exports for this country are, are, are nosediving. We can't carry on as a country not making money. So I didn't take it away from you. The referendum decided that we should leave the European Union and Boris Johnson won a majority in the election to end freedom of movement and take us out of the single market and customs union. So that's what we did. I would have liked to have been negotiate, able to negotiate something more flexible with the European Union, but unfortunately they weren't willing to offer the kind of uh, flexible arrangements that we, we what wanted. What were you asking them for? So what we wanted was something that would have streamlined uh, visa and work arrangement processes, rather like what we do internally for Europeans who want to come here and work. Unfortunately, that is a national competence in EU terms. In other words, the EU can't necessarily negotiate it for every single member state. Um, and it proved too complicated and too difficult, and they, they wouldn't do it. So I still think we could do something like that. And in fact, I gave a speech a couple of months ago saying I thought we should have another go at it. But we can't end freedom of movement for the, Europe, for the European Union and expect still to have it for, for us. And that was fully debated and that's where we are. But you can understand just frustration. I mean, it's not just frustration, it's affecting his ability to earn a living. I do understand the frustration and, um, you know, many businesses and many traders in this country have had to deal with the new arrangements, but that is what we had and have a democratic mandate to deliver arrangements that bring back powers to this country and restore democracy and enable us to, to forge our own way. I mean, you're using the word regret regret quite a lot, but there will be people like Jeff who voted leave and had no idea that this sort of thing would be one of the consequences. What, what can you say to them to give them hope that this can be resolved in an equitable way in the future? So I think, um, you know, ideally, and I hope it will happen, some of the tensions between us and the EU that were so obvious in 19 and 20 will, will start to diminish. And I think that is starting to happen. And whatever happens with Northern Ireland, um, I still think it will, will start to happen and things will, will normalise, but it will always be different. That's what leaving the customs union and the single market means. Jeff, thank you very much for your call. We'll come back to more of your calls in just a moment. It's 7.48. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Michael Gove is levelling up housing and community secretary. Johnson to let benefit claimants buy homes. What lies behind yes. this housing secretary? There are people who are receiving housing benefit at the moment who are in work and that benefit is going into the pockets of buy-to-let landlords rather than helping people to pay off a mortgage and acquire a home which they can pass on to their children. How confident are you once these folk have been put on the housing ladder? What about then maintaining their property? You're taking on an additional level of responsibility but I trust people to make their own decisions about budget. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. Did you?
Britain's Conversation. Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 7.52 on LBC. More questions to David Frost. Let's go to Bree, who's a new caller in Nottingham. Bree, hello. Hello there, Ian. How are you? Hi, I'm very well. What would you like to say? So I am, um, yes, I do live in Nottingham, but I'm originally from Northern Ireland, exactly right on the border, actually, from a small village. Um, so Northern Ireland is doing really, really well at the moment. Like the Good Friday Agreement has been the best thing that's happened to Northern Ireland. I'm old enough to remember when the Good Friday Agreement, pre-Good Friday Agreement. So Northern Ireland is doing really, really well. We've got the second best performing economy in the UK after London. And this is as a direct result of the protocol. The Northern Ireland election was a few weeks ago. Sinn Féin are now the biggest party. The, when you add them to the alliance, by far the biggest majority of people in Northern Ireland want the protocol to remain in place. Now, Lord Frost has said that the protocol was put in place to protect the Good Friday Agreement. But I would envisage that if they decided to retract the protocol or to amend the protocol, the Good Friday Agreement is going to be in bigger danger than what it ever was. You're going to have Republicans who have put down their arms 20 years ago potentially bringing them back up again. It just really strikes me as hugely coincidental that there has been no mention of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, apart from Geoffrey Donaldson and, and Sammy Wilson standing up at PMQs practically every Wednesday and asking the Tory government to do something to get rid of the protocol, has been ignored. Sinn Féin win the election in Northern Ireland or become the biggest party. And all of a sudden, there's a huge amount of urgency about sourcing out the Northern Ireland issue. I'd just like to understand from Lord Frost why he thinks this urgency has suddenly resurrected itself. Well, um, thanks, Bria. I think um, there's a lot in there, but I think the, the truth of it is that, I mean, the elections were not, quite as you characterise them in the sense that Sinn Féin is the largest party but they're no bigger than they were last time and there is division on the unionist side and that's why the, re the elections ended up as they did. The truth is though that the elections in a sense um, are only part of the story Everything in Northern Ireland, as you will know better than, than me, has to be done on a consensual basis, if you, you possibly can. And the truth is that amongst unionism, amongst one community, confidence in the protocol has collapsed and it's undermining the institutions. The DUP are not part of the institutions. And that's the political reality that has to be dealt with. Nobody wanted it to be like that. We'd much rather that the the protocol, uh, fragile as it is, is, could have continued, but, but what, we've got to what, wasn't, deal with it. Wasn't it this is. all foreseeable? Didn't Theresa May foresee this with, with her deal? And, I mean, you're blaming an awful lot of people uh, for what's happening here, but in the end, surely the buck has to stop with you. So the Theresa May deal uh, would have kept the whole of the UK in the customs union and the single market for goods and with a, with the EU with a, a, the key to the lock on that and would have generated a large amount of other problems. Moreover, the Theresa May deal still had a border uh, in the uh, a boundary in the Irish Sea that is sometimes forgotten. But we wouldn't have the issues with Northern Ireland like we do now, would we? We wouldn't have necessarily have the same issues, though I'm sort of slightly doubtful uh, about that. I'm never sure about dealing too much with hypotheticals. We knew that had a, a, the, the Theresa May deal had a lot of problems. This deal got through Parliament. The Theresa May deal did not. Uh, it was supported, uh, knowing its fragility, and unfortunately it's turned out to be a bit more fragile than any of us wanted. Bree, thank you very much. Uh, Geraldine in Waltham Forest is on the line. Hello, Geraldine, what would you like to ask? Oh, hello, hi. Um, hi. What does Mr Frost say to the tens of thousands of small businesses that now cannot sell on the internet to customers in the EU, our closest trading neighbours, uh, personally, I've lost 50% of my sales. I've seen businesses disappear. I mean, it's a deal that basically if you're a big company or you're re-smog, you install your business in the EU. What do you say to the tens of thousands and the lost trade? It's basically an absolute rubbish deal that you've got. That's the truth of it. It's not a good deal because how can you say it's an okay deal when we can't trade? We're in the 21st century. We're not 50 years ago where we would have not had the internet. We now have the internet and we cannot sell 
to the EU like we used to. It's not a good deal, sorry, because it disadvantages all the ten thousands of small businesses. What do you say to us? So, um, hi, Geraldine. Uh, obviously, I absolutely feel uh, for you and your business and the people like you, and that's why last autumn we set up a new um, organisation within the Trade Ministry designed to support uh, people like you and uh, but try and find a way But if you hadn't signed that deal through. in the first place, um, that wouldn't have had to happen. So, the, the, the only deal that would have... Uh, kept things unchanged would have been to remain in the Single Markets and Customs Union. And we had won the election and uh, got a majority on the basis that we were not going to do that. And that was argued out. And we we can't go back on, on that. What we have to do is find flexibilities. We have to support our companies uh, to, um, uh, to, to deal with the new arrangements. And yes, there, there are teething troubles and there are difficulties and I really feel for it but okay. that is what democracy and taking back your own rules means. Geraldine thank you very much. A final question from Evan in Slough. Hello Evan. Hi Lord Frost. Um, do, you, do you think that Boris Johnston is honest? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Hi, Evan. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. I, I do think he is honest. I've worked with him as closely as um, as anyone in the last few years. Why do you think so many people think he isn't? There's a lot of history. There's a lot of people who very strongly dislike. Boris Johnson, I think that that colours it. I would say I wish that he had got the uh, uh, the story and the history of what happened over Partygate. I wish he'd been clearer and fuller in the way that was explained. Were, were you aware of what was going on in Downing Street? I wasn't. Lockdown? I spent most of my, that time in Brussels or in various negotiating rooms elsewhere, so I wasn't really uh, aware. So you don't believe that he lied to the House of Commons about these parties? I take seriously what the, the Prime Minister said and he set out uh, that he didn't have the full facts and uh, that, that I, I think the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom should be trusted and believed on that. David Frost, thank you very much for joining us over the last hour. We must do it again sometime. Lo I mean, still loads of calls. We could have gone on for another hour, but I'm afraid uh, we can't. Coming up in the next hour... Um, it's been quite an emotional day for me today, ten, uh, 10 years since my mother died to the day. So I want to talk about grief and particularly long-term grief in the next hour. Um, does grief counselling work if you are still traumatised by the death of a relative or a friend years afterwards? 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC, I'm Ian Dale, it's 8 o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, a court in a Russian-held part of eastern Ukraine has sentenced two British men to death. 28-year-old Aidan Aslin and Sean Pinner, who 